Okay, so we're turning ourselves back towards our series, Infinite and Intimate. The infinite, almighty creator, God of the universe, is also this intimate God who knows us well, who knows our own passions, our desires. He can not only sympathize with us in every struggle we have, but he also adores us. He knows us well. And he's redeemed us for his purposes. And today we talk about, well, it's called How Beautiful. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, as the psalmist said. When the psalmist said that, I don't know that David understood that the gospel would one day be translated in Greek as good news. It's the good news. So we're going to talk today about what this beautiful good news is and how we as a church and how we as a people engage it. It's not often that, um, that we will share something like we did at the beginning of a service and then have a sermon that backs it up really well. But, but we do at this point. And I'm really thrilled about it. So what I want to do is delay no longer and dive into the text. We find ourselves today in John chapter 13. And it's right at the beginning of the Last Supper where Jesus instituted communion. It would have been the Passover Supper. Jerusalem would have been packed with over a million people into its city, into the city to have the Passover celebration. And we find Jesus around the table in John chapter 13, and this is the story. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So Jesus got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Real quick, um, before we read on, has anybody here ever had like one of your kids play outside all summer day long and come back in like so dirty that when you put them in the shower, the bottom of the shower turns a different color? Isn't that awesome? And they're like, I'm so tired. And you're like, I know, you really played today. Just imagine with me what it was like to wash the feet at the end of the day of disciples who would probably have walked 10 to 15 miles, there weren't paved roads, so it would have been dry, dry, dusty, caked, kind of, that'd be a nasty job, wouldn't it? That'd be the nastiest job. I mean, feet are already kind of balky, but now you've got them dirty and muddy and caked, and Jesus kneels down and begins to wash them. All right. So he came to Simon Peter, who said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, then you have no part with me. And then, Lord, Peter replies, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus said, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you, for Jesus knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, he returned to his place, and he said, do you understand what I have done for you? Do you understand what I have done for you? He asks. You call me teacher, and you call me Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now, that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So how do we make the most of our life? How do we make the most of our life? When you read a scripture like that, you think, well, maybe I don't know if I want to make the most of my life. It seems kind of gross. I don't want to do what Jesus did. 
I don't want to be a leader who washes the feet of dirty, ingrateful disciples who all but one will betray and run away from him later that night. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be someone who serves ingrates. Wouldn't you and I all say that? We don't want that. We begin to ask the question, how do I make the most of my life? And we answer it in a purely secular way, in a way that is defined by the rules of our culture. And Jesus says, no, 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 you will be very blessed if you follow me, not only in learning, but in doing, if you become like me. And one of the ways that we can recognize that how we make the most of our life is not to begrudge the small things, the little opportunities to be faithful, I don't think Pilate, the governor of Judea, understood the symbolism between the two different basins that happened a day apart. The basin that Jesus poured full of water and washed his disciples' feet with, and the basin to which Pilate poured full of water and washed his hands of and said, fine, this man's guilt is not on my hand, and step back. Pilate had an opportunity And he used it to say, I'm not guilty. He justified himself. There's two different basins in the Gospels. There's the basin that Jesus filled with water, and it's a small thing to do a great act of service to people that are less than. And Jesus did it. The master, the Lord, and the teacher washed the feet of his followers. And he set an example for Christians But we often have followed the example of Pilate. And we have washed our hands and said, well, I'm not going to serve anymore. I'm not going to do that. That's not my job. That's not what I signed up for. No guilt on me. There's two different basins. And they really ask one question. Choose you this day whom you will serve. The Lord Jesus Christ in all the little details of your life? Will you serve Jesus Christ when no one says thank you, when no one seems to change, when nothing goes right? I will tell you those are the hardest days to serve the Lord. It's pretty easy to be a pastor when the room's full. But when the room has shrunk to 21 people and people are looking at you going, can this please end? And you're like, I don't know what's happening. And you feel insecure and terrified and overwhelmed at your own existence and place in life. And you look at it and you go, God, I don't know what to do. Just keep doing the little things. Don't begrudge the small opportunities to be like Christ. Remember the basins. One is called to service. The other is called to justified existence. Which one will you live in? Don't wash your hands of the high calling of Christ in your life. You can't do that and stay here. We are people who understand we are called not only to be transformed into Christ's image, but to serve his kingdom come presently. Don't wash your hands and say, well, he's not talking to me. Because maybe God is. Maybe God's calling you. Maybe God's speaking in your life. And you have, to, you have to listen to the little things, the small opportunities, the two basins. Which one will you serve? How do I make the most of my life? The question echoes again. How do I make the most of this existence I live in light of what Jesus did with his disciples? How do I make the most of my life? You stop grasping. You and I love to grasp We love to get things. There was a guy, uh, Chuck Swindoll told the story of a guy who went to a psychologist. He went to the doctor and he said, I have been really struggling with with an inferiority complex. The psychologist ran a battery of tests over him and he brought him back to his office and he looked at him and he said, well, and the doctor said, it's true, you're inferior. Oh, we don't want to hear that, do we? We don't want to hear that Jesus meant what he said. That the greatest of these is the servant of all. That those of us in this world who have been given so much are not given so much that we are comfortable, but we are given so much that our lives become a generous existence of the kingdom of God. We must develop an inferiority complex and stop grasping for the finer things in life and start loving the opportunities to serve the low and the meek among us. And I am not just talking about financially. I'm talking about people in broken relationships. 
People in whacked out marriages who will not speak to each other. People who are angry and fighting the world around them constantly. And we are called to serve them and be an example of love and peace and grace. And not participate in the craziness, but be servants to them. Their life's already chaotic enough. The kingdom of God should be coming through us and existing in their life. We should be the peace of Christ in their life. But instead, what are we doing? We're adding to the chaos by grasping for title, for influence, for importance, and we miss the message of the basin, of the washed feet, of the men who Jesus loved, knowing that they didn't love him quite as much because they would all run except for John. So how do we stop grasping? The Apostle Paul as he always does. If you don't know who Paul is, Paul was a guy who um, persecuted the church. Um, the early church, he was present when they stoned and killed Stephen. He was one that took letters from the high priest to go arrest Christians in Damascus. He was a brutal, brutal Pharisee religious person. And he was out to kill church people. And then he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And his life changed. He was never the same again. And that same guy who breathed out murderous threats against the church wrote this about Jesus in Philippians. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Catch this. Who, being in very nature God, Jesus being in the very nature of God, fully God and fully human, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. The other translations say, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Jesus Christ, being in very nature God, didn't think his equality with God was something to be used to his advantage, something to grab, but instead he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself becoming, by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Do you know what death on a cross does? It's brutal. The church has to wake up and quit romanticizing Jesus Christ's death. He died. He choked on his own blood. It filled his lungs. And his last words were, it is finished. And that means for you and I, our past is finished and our future is called into bringing his kingdom to bear on this world. He took on the, the human likeness and he humbled himself. Not only did he wash feet, but then he had his feet pierced with a nail. He had his hands driven with nails. He hung on the cross, separated from God, bearing the sin of the world. And God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, so that on heaven above, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, in heaven and on earth. And every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I want to tell us something. Our feet and our tongues must work together in this. Your life must live this gospel, even as your mouth proclaims it. If you confess Christianity, your life must be in motion for this gospel. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. How many people have seen a picture like this from a friend that you're jealous of on vacation? Anybody hate that person too? Don't show me your shiny toenails. Because mine are gangly and messed up and in Michigan, right? That's how you feel. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. How can I make the most of my life? You can serve. Because Jesus Christ told us, that's who I am. He said, that's who I am. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Those are the words of Christ's life. How can I make the most of my life? You can serve it to the very end. You can serve with your life. And I don't mean going back to the buffet for you. Either spiritual, economic, relational. You don't share anything, there's a problem. You can serve. Serve the world around you. It's not easy. But the reality is, service takes on a lot of strange faces in our life. 
I remember when we did a mission trip with Vertigo uh, to Washington, D.C. in 2013, and Erica and I went there, and we were planning the trip out, and we kept praying, God, what are we supposed to do? You know, kind of give us something. Give us a beat-up house to renovate, paint, and make happy, right? Because then the world will know that a youth group paints poorly. God bless. <laughs> right? Is that not kind of what we've done? And I'm not saying we always did it that way. But the Lord said, go pray for people. There was a guy standing just outside the metro station, and he was inviting people to um, take a moment for his certain agenda in life, you know, so could have been animal rights. We'll use animal rights because it's almost hunting season. And um, just irony is always fun. And he said, do you have a moment for animal rights? 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 People walked by him, didn't care, and they stopped one person. And the guy said, what do you mean? And he told him the gospel of animal rights. And I looked at Erica and I was like, we should pray for everybody in this national mall. We should send teams of people out and just say, do, do you have a moment for me to pray for you? Oh, it was awesome. But we didn't do anything. We were absolutely ineffective. We prayed for hundreds, maybe even thousands of people. And we did bubkis. There wasn't a lot of work done that trip. But I'll never forget looking out into the National Mall and seeing some Vertigo students with their, you know, I have a moment to pray for your tie-dye t-shirt on, holding hands with a bunch of strangers in a circle and people walking away going, thanks, I just needed somebody to pray for me. And you're like, how awesome are we? How awesome. We had a chance to pray for people we'll never see again and don't remember their names afterwards. How awesome is that to serve and be uncomfortable? To be uncomfortable. Mother Teresa put her life in the most un, oh, it was only service. And I love that this great Catholic saint of, um, I think she was Albanian, this little Albanian woman who was not much taller than this little thing here, just stood taller than Goliath himself. And Protestants and Catholics embrace her alike. We forget we're Protestant when Mother Teresa's around, right? Because we all want part of that. Why? Because she served. She served with everything she had. She didn't call anyone to do something she wouldn't do herself. She served. Do you know the first thing she did that lit her heart up for Calcutta? She laid down in the gutter next to a man dying of leprosy and put her arm around him so he could die not alone. Doesn't feel like she did much. But he wasn't alone. She gave of herself in costly ways. And we in the West sit back and go, well, I give 2%, I volunteer once a month. No, that's not Christianity. Christianity is following Jesus Christ because we love him. Because we love him. He is not our way out of hell. He is our purpose for living today. And if we're going to play church, play somewhere else. Let's love him. Let's be the people of God who serve in ways that break our hearts so finally we can identify with him whose heart has been broken for lost souls for all of time. Let's be people who serve at great cost to ourselves. How do I make the most of my life? How do I make the most of my life? Laying down your rights to yourself is really the only way. Can you show that next picture? That's Mother Teresa's feet. How beautiful. Do you know why they look like that? Because thousands, millions of generous Westerners would send shoes, not to the random, you know, like Catholic diocese in Rwanda, but to Mother Teresa's outpost because she was, she was a big name and, and people loved her. And she would give out shoes to all of the people, all the orphans, all the people. And in the end, if she needed shoes, she would get a pair, but they never fit. They were the worst ones. And that's what her feet looked like in the end. Tell me this, whose feet are more beautiful? The ones on the sandy beach propped up and crossed or those. At some point, the church better lay down its right to itself and start following Christ in mission. Do you not know that you were bought at a price? And that price was the blood of the high king of heaven, 
shed for you, not only for the remission of your sins, but that your life would be a living gospel to the world around you. Let's make no mistake about what we're about here. We are going to be about people coming to know Jesus. Whether they've met him earlier in their life and walked away, whether they've never met him before, or whether they've just known enough about him up here to never care to live it out here. We are going to know Jesus Christ. And then everything we do, every energy we have, will be poured into knowing God and then making him known. We are not here to be perfect Christian relics. If you've got it together, I beg you, find a different church. We're messed up, torn up, bad people here who need Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior. And from that power, our lives can change. But you and I get no more excuses on thinking that the gospel is something we do once a week on a Sunday morning. I'm guessing seating won't be as big of an issue next week. But I have to be okay with that. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't leave room for us to have half of it. You are either a Christian called in service to Almighty God, or you are not. And by the blood of Christ, you are saved. But by the Spirit of God, you are called into a life that answers the question, how do I make the most of my life? You let Christ live through you. And what did Christ do? He remembered that equality with God was not something to be grasped, but he made himself in the form of a servant. And he served the world around him, even to the point of his own death. And then the hard part is, is he called us to do the same thing. I cannot be more excited for what God's about to do in somebody's life by realizing this half-hearted Christian life isn't it, but the full living for Jesus, serving God with all that we are. This is a place worth living. As we go into our song, I'm going to invite you to um, approach God. We chose this song for a reason. I'm going to invite you to come to God on his terms, not yours. And confess, even during the song, if you have not given your life to Christ, give it to him. And invite him to call you into things you never dreamed or expected. And then let your life become a celebration of his all-sufficient work to redeem what is broken. Let's pray. God, we are your church. In our brokenness, we recognize that we have, um, we have missed many times over the high calling of Christ. We have missed the opportunity to live for you because we have sought comfort. So God, we pause now and we repent. Forgive us for our need for comfort. Forgive us for our need for more. May we not wash our hands of the high calling of you, Lord Jesus Christ. May we not be like Pilate and wash our hands and say, this isn't on me. But may we put the towel around our waist and begin to serve a dirty, broken world around us. Not out of a love that we have, but out of a love that you've given us for the world you love and died for. Lord Jesus Christ, give us the courage to draw near now to you and you only. We ask this in Jesus' name. At heart, I am a people pleaser, and everything in me wants to say, if I've made you uncomfortable this morning, I'm super sorry, and I'm not I just can't be and I want to be. I want to be sorry for the discomfort and the awkwardness and the emotion and the feel, but I can't be because at some point we either are the body of Christ or we're not. It's time to choose. It is time to choose who we are. Are we the people of God called into his image or are we not? The question is yours to answer. The question is mine to answer. Not just with our tongues, but with our feet. And how beautiful will it be when the feet of God's people go out bearing the good news of a life transformed into Christ's image. My friends, as you go from this place, I invite you to wrestle with confession, repentance, and transformed living. I invite you to get desperately uncomfortable in this place and in your life 
for the sake and the glory of Jesus Christ, that his kingdom would be brought to bear on the world that you have influence over. As you do this, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, the church must leave the building. You are dismissed.